Russian forces advance in Ukraine. When and how will this conflict end? Hello, I'm Nathan King, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. And Russian forces are gaining ground in the eastern part of Ukraine, forcing citizens to flee the region. Ukraine is, of course, asking for more assistance from the West to try and repel Russian soldiers. And we start with this report from Sergei Olmos in Kiev. The war continues in the east as the, as the Russian armed forces try to take the town of Severodonetsk. It has been in battle for the last few weeks. According to Ukraine's deputy defense minister, Russia is trying to reach the border of the Luhansk region by the end of the week. This backs up an assessment by the British Ministry of Defense that says that Russia has been concentrating its forces in the Severodonetsk pocket in order to make gains. And though not much territory has been uh, gain, gained by the Russian armed forces, they have made some gains, including today taking the town uh, near Severodonetsk. Uh, the Ukrainian army has been largely outgunned. Uh, by the Russian armed forces who have much bigger artillery and more ammunition to use. At the same time, we're hearing from Ukrainian uh, officials that they struck, they continue to strike at Russian vessels in the Black Sea near Snake Island this past week. They struck a tugboat, according to Ukrainian officials, and today they are saying they struck uh, another uh, target in the Black, uh, in Snake Island that, according to Ukrainian officials, cost a, a lot of Russian lives. Uh, we have not been able to independently confirm that. Uh, but this comes as the big question remains of what this conflict will uh, look uh, like after the Russian armed forces uh, look past Donbass. At the moment, they have 97 percent of control of Luhansk. Ukraine believes that they are trying to take all of Luhansk by the end of the week. There's a lot of anxiety about what will happen to port cities like Odessa. Uh, will a new offensive begin in that region to try to take control of that city? Uh, Ukraine has been making, uh, has been counterattacking in the Kherson region. Uh, making some small gains, minimal, about the same gains that Russia is making in, in Luhansk. But there is a lot of anxiety about what the next phase of the war might look like. At the moment, it is an artillery war that, though not a lot of ground has been exchanging hands, uh, it's been a lot of blood loss on both sides, about 200 Ukrainian soldiers a day being killed. And evacuations in the town of Severodonetsk remain difficult as uh, the last remaining th uh, bridge has been blown up. Uh, connecting Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. At the same time, there are about 568 civilians still uh, taking shelter in the Azot chemical plant in Severodonetsk. So no, no end uh, to the war uh, at the moment as the Russian armed forces uh, continue uh, pounding away at cities in the east. Well, to discuss the situation in Ukraine, let's bring in our panel. From Kiev, we have Pavlo Kukta. He's a former Ukrainian acting minister of economy. Thanks for joining us so much. From Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer, he is a defense analyst and a columnist for Novaya Gazeta. And Remy Pien is a senior partner at the consulting company Emberley Advisory, old friend of the show, and he joins us from uh, Miami. And here in D.C., another old friend of the show, Anton uh, Fedyashin. He's a professor of history at American University. Thanks so much, all of you, for joining us. Uh, Pavlo, especially from Kiev, it's always good to have voices from the heart of the region. Um, what's the situation on the ground, especially in the east? And... Uh, how much is sort of Western efforts to supply weapons making a difference, or is still more needed to be done from Kiev's point of view? Well, I think you've summarized it uh, quite neatly in the clip you've shown. So, yes, the situation in the East and in the South, where the war essentially continues, so 90% of the country is actually free. It's a rear area now. So yeah. the war there is kind of ground to a standstill. It's a positional artillery war with a lot of casualties on both sides, but very little ground actually changing hands. Uh, and yes, the Western supplies do uh, balance things somewhat. So essentially, when you think about it, Western weapons tend to be better than what the Russians have. The Russians have uh, more weapon systems, but Ukraine now has better systems. And this tends to help even things out a little bit. And I think this is seen clearly from the military situation, where essentially both sides are digging down, mm -hmm. lots of losses, but no real progress on any side. And that is how it is on the front okay. line. In the rear, 
Ukraine is conti it's continued to be attacked by missiles from Russia, essentially now targeted infrastructure. For example, a couple of days ago, they tried to target uh, fuel producing infrastructures, so refineries, and fuel bases. Uh, but again, uh, beyond that, it's actually a relatively safe area. So missile do hit, otherwise it's peaceful. Pavlo, I just want to do a quick follow up with you because we've had some real trouble, haven't we, nailing down Ukrainian casualty numbers, um, especially since we've seen an upsurge of this artillery war, as you said, which, which is claiming lots of casualties. I read things of 100 Ukrainian soldiers dead, 500 in a day, 250, as Sergio just said in his report there. Why isn't Kiev releasing any of these numbers, and what is the actual number? Uh, is the question addressed yes. to me? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, uh, I think the president has announced an official number. It's in the hundreds. Again, you have to understand that essentially these are the numbers for, let's say, the last few days, and they tend to change for obvious reasons. It's a battlefield. Like, it's not like it's a static um, situation where 100 people die every day. So sometimes there are large losses and losses on both sides. Sometimes there are calmer days. But yes, they are large. They number in the hundreds. Um, I want to go to uh, Pavel now, because at the beginning of this uh, special military operation, as the Kremlin calls it, uh, there was very much a, a focus on uh, getting as much Russian fa firepower in there as possible very quickly. Th then there seems to be this more stalemate situation, although with incremental Russian advances uh, in the east. What is the growing feeling in Moscow about the West's uh, accelerated response when it comes to more weaponry, which of course is being used to target uh, uh, Russian soldiers? Um, well, in the beginning, the Russian forces were advancing on five fronts, at least, very swiftly. And not all these advances led to eventual success. Some did. Now the Russian clearly don't, military don't have enough reserves or capabilities to advance on the entirety of the front. So they've concentrated in one area, more or less. It's like the Germans in First World War in 1916, when they concentrated on the, city, on the fortress of Verdun. The idea of this uh, concentration, it's not just simply to uh, take the ground in Lugansk and Donetsk. It's to use Russian firepower, artillery superiority uh, to uh, grind down, inflict maximum casualties on the Ukrainian military, break their morale, as the Germans want to break the morale of the French then in, on, on, at Verdun. And if the Ukrainian morale snaps, Ukrainian military may begin to retreat. Ukraine will ask for peace. And yes, there is some success in that. Not yeah. only there are high casualties, there are reports of problems with Ukrainian morale that there are more desertions. And uh, so this is how the, Ru the Russian military hoped to win this conflict. Uh, but of course, I... uh, the supplies coming in from the West are not welcome. Uh, but uh, the official line is that Russia is going to win anyway, and that Western supplies of weapons are not sufficient enough. And they are just simply prolonging the war, but they're not replacing the number of uh, equipment that the Ukraine, Ukraine is losing. Uh, thank you. I'm going to move on to the political uh, side. Remy Piet, uh, I want to bring you in here too, because obviously, as well as Western uh, military support, we're seeing increased political support, uh, albeit symbolic at the moment, especially um, uh, granting candidate status for Ukraine's application to join the European Union. Um, how likely is this going to happen? The, the timeline, I see everything from six months to ten years, uh, if not more. And what are the dangers here going forward as well? No, obviously, I mean, you, you do mention some, some key movement on the political front and in terms of, of, of supporting Ukraine from the European side. The, this is obviously more symbolic than anything because the, right. the timeline for the currency to turn into something that, that would actually take form as a membership is, is, is a very long timeline and you have to uh, integrate a lot of what is called the Aki Communitaire inside your own uh, legislative framework to be able to be part of the European yeah. Union. Nevertheless, that actually reinforces the alliance system uh, from the Western countries to, to Ukraine. And it's very interesting when we actually have the, the former panelists mentioning the First World War. This is exactly the scenario that we're seeing. 
And we have to remember the First World War actually lasted until the, the Germans were coming out of, you know, running out of uh, ammunition and in economic uh, capacities to continue uh, moving forward to, to, during the, the war. And this is the same situation we're seeing today. We're about to see a very long-lasting conflict between Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine backed by, by Western powers. And it's very unlikely that Russia can actually you know, maintain the superiority militarily in the long run. Uh, keep in mind that Russia, in terms of economics, is no much bigger than Italy, just one of European countries. It's unlikely that they'll be able to sustain this long-lasting effort in, into you know, several years. So maybe Putin is indeed trying, President Putin is trying to get some you know, good military gains on the ground in the short run and, and try to maybe try to settle for a negotiation agreements claiming that the eastern Ukraine is Russophone and Russophile and therefore should be part of Russia. But it's very clear also from the side of Ukraine and, and European power that they will not abandon, uh, you know, the, the eastern part of Ukraine. The visit from President Macron uh, together with uh, German and Romanian and Italian counterparts to Kiev earlier this week showed the, the complete support to an integration, to, to the integrity of the Ukrainian uh, territory. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, hard for President Putin to continue this uh, catastrophic, let's put it this way, in terms also in terms of casualties, in terms of economic impact on the Russian economy uh, for a long run, uh, more than, than a, a few months. So that, that will be interesting to follow in, uh, you know, in this long-lasting conflict. Thanks. Uh, and Anton, this brings me on to my next point, which is essentially, um, it seems that the U.S. point of view, they're very much involved in, some, in a proxy war when it comes to uh, fighting, uh, uh, supplying weapons and political support uh, for Kiev. And is this something that Washington actually secretly wouldn't mind going on for a while, bleeding the Russians die? Some cynically argue it's uh, fighting the Russians to the last Ukrainian in the East, at least. Um, is this something what, uh, that we should bear in mind, considering the absence of any significant peace efforts at the moment? Well, Nathan, this is, as always, a question of uh, cost and uh, benefit, of course. Um, if you had asked me this about a month and a half ago or two months ago, uh, the answer would have been that, yes, Washington was uh, 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 fully behind uh, Ukraine uh, because the price that the United States paid was really negligible. But now that we're um, in the second half of June and inflation is rising, the gas prices are going up, and in general, uh, the massive sanctions that have been leveled against uh, Russia are having, for the first time in the history of sanctions, a very serious um, side effect, a blowback. But, but, Anton, are they, though? I mean, I've been reading... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But I've been reading some stuff that the rubles now double what it was worth before, uh, before the invasion. The um, oil and gas revenues going into Russia are sky high because of the price yep. largely. Europeans can't seem to wean themselves off and also extra demand from India, China, etc. They seem to have insulated their industries quite well. The price controls work quite well. The interest rates were at 20% and are now half that, which is what they were before the invasion. So, I mean... You know, you can say that the, these sanctions are having an effect, but, but it seems Russia's learned a few lessons here. Uh, Nathan, you're making my point. Uh, listen, my point initially was about the blowback of the sanctions on the United yeah. States and on Europe. This is the unprecedented part. The fact that uh, an economy uh, that's uh, um, under Western sanctions, uh, the West being financially and technologically by far the most powerful uh, bloc in the world, that, there's nothing surprising about that. So the, the issue here is how long can the United States and Western Europe, especially the populations of these uh, uh, areas, withstand the, uh, the blowback of the sanctions? And you're right that the Russian economy has weathered this in the short term much, much better than anyone, including, by the way, many Russians, uh, yes. including the government, had uh, expected. Uh, the question now is really how long will Western populations uh, withstand uh, the unintended side effects on themselves? And judging by the demonstrations um, and the growing discontent, uh, look at the result of the election in France, for example, uh, the parliamentary one, I mean, yes. um, there's no guarantee that Western societies are going to uh, be willing to sacrifice over the long term. Pablo, that's something I want to put to you in Kiev, because, uh, you know, at least uh, uh, rhetorically, the West has been very united over the last uh, three months. NATO's never had it so good. You're looking at Sweden and Finland joining, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at it from this side of the Atlantic, people are much more worried about inflation than they are about Ukraine. 
Uh, and as you know, President Biden was, was due to visit, hasn't visited. His numbers are a bit underwater when it comes to support for the war in Ukraine is softening as worries about oil prices, etc. jump up. Are people in war, uh, worried in Kiev that Washington will sort of step back from this a little bit uh, or fissures could emerge in Europe, especially between sort of the France and Germany and, and the eastern powers that tend to share a border with Russia? Well, look, uh, I wouldn't mix in uh, different problems together. First of all, we all knew that inflation crisis was coming even before the war. Yeah, but it's, I mean, really, it's really, really serious everywhere. I mean, look at the UK, you know, double-digit inflation. I know it's quite serious. I, uh, macroeconomics is essentially my profession. Sorry, and again, I didn't mean we knew to it let would be coming. Yeah. We knew it would be coming. We knew it before the war. So this is not created by the war. The war does not create inflation in America. It, it might add something to it, but not more. Let's be realistic about it. It does create more problems in Europe, particularly related to The problem to is Africa. Joe Biden's calling it that. It's calling it Putin's prices at the pub. So, you but, know, but you're again, basically disagreeing would, with I'm your major backer here. I would not get into domestic yeah. American politics and who's sure, taking but what. Sure, but it, it's a but salient point. As an economist, I can clearly tell you that the inflation was <laughs> coming all over the world. We're in it. Even without the war, you would have it, right? So it was unavoidable. It might have some of these additional costs might come from the war, the energy, etc., but they are minor compared to the inflation crisis that the world was facing anyway. And we shouldn't mix the two. That's first thing number one. Thing number two, inflation is coming from the foodstuffs, which are actually blocked by Russia. So stop the blockade, introduce convoys or whatever, unlock the Ukrainian ports, you get Ukrainian grain out the food prices will drop a bit. So there is the solution to that. It can be done quickly if the world, particularly neutral countries, manage to agree on that. Actually, the negotiations on that thing are proceeding. So the solution might come quicker than we may be expect. This would actually help ameliorate the inflation pretty well. And Ukraine is the solution here, so not the problem. Uh, energy in Europe is more tricky, but I think it's up to Europeans <coughs> decide whether they want to be dependent on Russia as an energy supplier, because we see that that energy supplier is entirely unreliable. I would expect them to try to diversify anyway, regardless of the current short-term costs. They will try to have different energy sources than Russia. Well, so, again, we, we should not mix these two problems. What I'm particularly worried is the foodstuffs, and not only inflation. I mean, it's inflation in the rich countries. In the poor countries, it's famine. That's what's coming to yes. Africa, for example, yes. because Ukrainian grain is locked in the ports by Russia. So, again, unlocking the ports, lifting that port blockade would actually go a long way to ameliorating the situation, making it easier for everybody. Of course, Russia and, and knows. Obviously, that part of that is, is Ukraine, Ukraine lifting the mines as well. Would that, would that happen immediately? Well, that's, that's part of the blockade. Ukraine can lift the mines if Ukraine understands that it's guaranteed that the Russian warships will not enter its ports afterwards. So it's part, you know, the solution has to somehow uh, contain all that. And for, I mean, the only realistic one is some kind of military convoy, possibly not by NATO members, but by neutral countries, for example. Right. Turkey, so, for example, yeah. the neutral countries yeah. essentially protecting Ukrainian ports and allowing convoys to flow. That could kind of guarantee the situation okay. and, again, ameliorate the problem big time. Because the problem is the fact that the grain, which used to supply hundreds of millions of people with food, is sitting locked in the country. It cannot leave it. Yeah. because the ports are blocked. No yeah. other logistical route to export it fast enough. Okay, well, I'm going to bring in Remy here as well, because you talked about, uh, obviously, uh, European uh, dependence on uh, Russian oil and gas. Um, there's a lot of commitments that are sort of back-ended towards this year. Do you really see countries like Germany being able to deliver? Obviously, people are hungry. Uh, certain countries like Hungary have got a bit longer. But, you know, they're firing up coal fired power stations again uh, in Germany, using more coal. And, you know, I respect what, uh, what Pablo was saying, but the inputs, too, like fertilizer costs and all this sort of stuff, are really uh, making this sting in a way that I don't think many European powers envisaged uh, just four months ago when the war started. 
Yeah, I mean, there's indeed a, a strong economic uh, impact on, on, on European countries. And, and as, as Pavel was exactly explaining, energy is part of it, but there was inflationary pressures before the, the war following the COVID crisis and, and a series of, of uh, let's say, monetary easing. And, and the foodstuff and, and agricultural prices are a key part of the equation. So if we can actually find a solution, maybe transiting some of those grains through Romania, which is what is being uh, studied right now, that might actually you know, limit the, the inflation. But more importantly, when you're looking at uh, European countries, and, and, and a former, another panelist made a, a very interesting point about, about France and the fact that Macron uh, was not able to secure absolute majority in the parliament, uh, it's still a, a slight victory for Macron. And even the other you know, opposition parties have been backing Ukraine against, uh, against Russia. Mélenchon, which is is uh, the left-wing party uh, in, in, in France that claims victory because it's actually arriving to the second parties in, in France is actually very strongly, adamantly against, uh, against uh, Putin, although he disagrees with the policies of, of France being part of, of NATO. That's a little switched uh, in, in terms of, of their position. But it's much more those, those uh, you know, results of elections are much more results of domestic uh, issues and, 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 and trying to you know, offset you know, Macron, and that, that could be also the case in other countries, than actually a, a, a discontentment towards European policies Towards, uh, towards Russia and Ukraine, there's still very strong support and backing from, you know, European populations to Ukraine and welcoming, you know, uh, uh, refugees in, in, different, okay. in different countries, okay. supporting, the, supporting the country. But indeed, there are some, some costs to it. And it seems that, you know, whether you're looking at Americans or Europeans, they are willing to support it and to continue despite the strong economic impact on, 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 on the population, Thank which you. is nothing compared to the actual famines and, and starvation sure. that Afri countries in Africa and Latin America might be facing because of, of Putin blocking. Okay. exports from, from foodstuffs. Well, Pavel, I want to bring the Russian side in here because uh, uh, Vladimir Putin seems to find and the opinion polls in Russia seem to be still uh, very much backing this war. So you have a Europe that's still united despite costs, as, as Remy was just saying. Uh, just uh, listen to a few words that we have from Vladimir Putin, who seemed very confident praising the soldiers uh, the other day and talking about new uh, weapons being deployed, potentially. Our armed forces now have unrivaled S-500 air and missile defense systems. Sarma's intercontinental ballistic missiles have been successfully tested. We are planning for the first such complex to be deployed by the end of the year. Pavel, what do you make of this uh, uh, sort of confident swagger that we're seeing from Vladimir Putin at this stage in the conflict? Well, uh, Putin is, of course, uh, he's uh, uh, projecting uh, optimism that everything is going, it will be fine, that the war is winnable, and that we just have to stay the course. Well, that's basically normal for any leader in such a situation. Uh, his uh, uh, cabinet ministers and his administration are also projecting optimism, because if you don't project op optimism from the Kremlin or the Russian government, well, you'll be out of uh, a job soon. Uh, but the Russian industry uh, leaders are rather pessimistic because there's very serious problems coming up. A very strong ruble is not a very healthy thing at all because Russian exports of metals Good and point, of yeah. uh, actually oil products are becoming economically senseless because the price uh, in rubles is has fallen th uh, three times of, of the uh, Ural's uh, barrel of oil. Uh, and because yeah. the ruble is so strong and that there's a big discount. So Russia right now is not exporting still, but not importing essential imports, which means that there'll be growing problems in its industry and its basic infrastructure of the country in the coming months. So there's a lot of problems here. They have not yet hit very seriously the population, though there is, of course, a dip, very serious dip in uh, uh, incomes, because a lot of Amer uh, Western companies left, their employees are not getting uh, salaries or getting kind uh -huh. of basics, but not for a long time. And that's uh, uh, not, so it's a potentially uh, a serious situation. If this war doesn't end soon, uh, there are going to be very serious problems in the Russian economy and most likely in the Russian social networks in the fall. Okay, well, I want to also just follow up with you quickly about um, 
unintended consequences of this potentially spreading. As you know, uh, Lithuania uh, and uh, Russia are in a bit of a shouting match over Lithuania says it's imposing new EU sanctions and stops some rail shipments into Kaliningrad, the, uh, uh, the, the Russian outcrop that used to be part of Prussia um, on the Baltic. Uh, basically, Russia accusing them of, of having an embargo. Yeah, there's the map. Uh, anyone uh, who is obsessed with European history knows that little bit very, very well. Um, so is there a potential for a wider conflict considering how the Baltic states and, and others seem to be leading the sort of uh, uh, pressure on Moscow? And, and what is the calculus uh, in the Kremlin about that? Well, yes, there is, of course, the potential of the conflict escalating into an all-European war. Though that seems a bit right now remote, really no one wants it, and uh, Russian, of course, uh, all the forces right now engaged in the special operations mm -hmm. in Ukraine, there's not much there left, I mean, of conventional capabilities to begin anything serious in the Baltic area. So I believe that and hope that this, and going in, over nuclear, well, that's right now, of course, also a bit remote, because what will that actually bring Russia good? Okay, well... Uh, so there will be, of course, a lot of threats pushed around, but I don't think that there's imminent threat of the Kaliningrad-Lithuania kind of confrontation right now blowing over into... Uh, military confrontation. Well, I'm going to leave you with just this last question. I'm going to ask everyone as well. But, Pavel, as you're speaking, I'll let you answer it first. What does peace look like in terms of, uh, from Moscow's point of view? Well, Moscow's very clear. They, they said that Ukraine should recognize Crimea as Russian, recognize uh, the Donbass as a lost uh, part of Ukraine, now independent, maybe becomes part of Russia. And then maybe we can talk about a kind of pro-Russian uh, uh, Ukraine existing in some kind of form. Okay. Uh, for Ukraine, that's not acceptable. So that means the two sides are miles apart, and it's uh, going to be war and not negotiations in the coming months. Anton, to you, uh, Washington have have said uh, that uh, obviously it's Ukrainians who have to decide uh, what peace looks like. Even though essentially uh, Washington will obviously have a say. What does peace look like, or, or can we not even predict that so far out on the horizon? Well, so far, there doesn't seem to be much of an overall strategy except to uh, send weapons over and to basically see what happens. The hope here in Washington is obviously that the Ukrainians will get um, as much as they want, ideally everything that they want. But cooler heads in D.C. are, of course, realizing that uh, most wars do not uh, end with clean uh, victories. Okay. They with pragmatic solutions, and I think that's what's going to have to happen. And Pablo, you, sorry, I'm going to have to skip you, Remy. I've been told to wrap. Um, uh, Pablo, what, what would Ukrainians accept? Uh, look, I think at this point we should be talking not about some kind of grand bargain, but about simply reaching a ceasefire mm. on both ports and normalizing the situation, at least a bit. At least that would be the first step to calming the situation down and the conflict resolving the problems for everyone. And these are the things I would be well, Pablo, thank you so much for joining us from Kiev. Everyone from Washington, D.C. to Miami and all points in between. Very stimulating and respectful discussion on a very hot topic, which unfortunately is still very hot indeed, the war over Ukraine. That's it from me. Thanks for joining us for this edition of The Heat. I'll be with you soon. Bye.